In this video, we're looking at John Stuart Mill's excerpts from Utilitarianism. In this video, is asking the, or in this piece, he's asking the question of what is the right act or what is the moral act. We can contrast this with uh, uh, Aristotle, who's asking, you know, what is uh, the right character or what's the uh, right kind of state that a person should be in. Mill's not asking this question; he's rather, he's asking, what should we do? Which is different than who should you be. His main, his, his, his main theory is, is that people ought to follow the greatest happiness principle. And this is that actions are right in proportion to the extent they uh, promote happiness and wrong, uh, that they tend to promote the reverse of happiness. Now that, you know, that's kind of a mouthful. And in some ways it seems really obvious, which is a lot of what Mill has to say is the justification for his belief. It's like, who doesn't want to be happy? Now, the, you know, to really fully understand the greatest happiness principle, we have to tease out a couple of important parts of the principle. First, his theory is consequentialist. That means that uh, the right act is going to is going to be determined in part by the consequences, or not in part, but completely by the consequences. And the consequences that matter here have to deal with happiness. So the idea is you weigh. You look at several different courses of action before you. You figure out which course of action produces the most happiness, and you take that course of action. It doesn't really matter how you do it. I mean, of course, how you do it could have some impact on the, the results, but it's, in the end, it's the results that matter, not so much how you go about doing it or even what kind of person you are. Although Mill has a lot to say about a uh, moral motivation. He thinks that you're going to be happier if you have the right motivation, sure. But in the end, that that uh, what's going to make the difference is the consequences of the act, but not how you perform the act or uh, even uh, your motivations. So he's uh, he's saying that the, the consequences that matter is happiness. Now we've been dealing with happiness a lot over this semester, but for him happiness is pleasure in the absence of pain. And, you know, by unhappiness, it means pain and the privation of pleasure. Now, this just sound an awful lot like Epicurus. Epicurus, you know, look, excuse me, Mill definitely took some cues from Epicurus here. But like Epicurus, and he's quick to defend Epicurus in, 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 his, in his piece here, like Epicurus, he says that, you know, not all pleasures are created equal. There are such things as higher pleasures. I mean, these are going to involve the mind, the intellect, uh, the will. These are going to involve uh, making yourself more of what's human. So we could probably see some kind of influences of Aristotle and what he has to say here. He thinks that, you know, there, sure, there, he's not going to deny that there are all kinds of pleasures, but it's the higher pleasures that make the difference, right? He doesn't want to turn us into, uh, you know, well, you can, take, you can uh, <laughs> let your imagination flow with that one. Kind of contrasted to the higher pleasures would be something like the lower pleasures. These would be simply pleasures of the body. These would be, uh, you know, your your typical night in Vegas, right? Um, and the idea here is, is that you, you do, uh, you, you follow sensuality, what Aristotle calls sensuality. You know, so Mill is not going to deny that this is pleasure, right? He's not going to deny that. But he thinks that there's, you know, it's definitely a difference between higher pleasures and lower pleasures. How do we know which is which? How do we know which is the higher pleasure and the which is the lower pleasure? Well, he has this. He has this statement that look, you know, people who are acquainted with both will inevitably choose the higher pleasures. Yeah, sure, every once in a while, my you know, moment of weakness might dive into the lower pleasures again, but in the at the end of the day, the higher pleasures are going to win out. If somebody you know sows their wild oats and then they uh, take up reading or they take up uh, uh, you know a study of a serious topic. Uh, or they take up opera, or they're going to they're look to the, these higher pleasures. You know, may, you might dabble in McDonald's every once in a while, but then you'll study really good cuisine and you know follow really good cuisine. That, it's always going to happen that eventually you're going to choose the higher road. You're always going to choose the higher pleasures if you're acquainted with both. He thinks this is obvious that that we think this is true. It's better to be a human dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Better be a Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. He thinks that we do this. Even if, and he says, you know, it requires more. It requires more to take on the higher pleasures. 
But once you've had that taste of the higher pleasures, you won't want to go back to anything else, at least not on a regular basis. Yeah, sure, you might fall in temptation or once in a while. And, you know, we might even catch this out these days. You can get kind of frustrated chasing the higher pleasures, but you can't quite get it. So you, you go out for a night of fun or something like that. Oh, okay, trying to blow off some steam. But in the end, he says, uh, we would always choose these higher pleasures. Something else that's really important with the greatest happiness principle, it's not the individual that matters. Right? It's not the happiness of the one that's important. It's the greatest happiness overall. Now, that doesn't mean everybody's going to be happy. No. And it doesn't mean that um, um, you know we're all going to have equal happiness. No, that doesn't mean. What he means is that we have to consider the course of action we're going to take. We have to measure the happiness of all the people affected by our actions. And whichever action has the greatest happiness of the greatest number of people, that's the course of action that, that we should take. He, th he th thinks that uh, we should teach this from a very young age, that we should train people to think this way, to think of the, uh, the uh, collective rather than the individual. So this is an interesting consequence of his view as well. Is This isn't about you. Your actions are not about you. Your actions are about others. That wraps it up, at least for the moment, for utilitarianism. We'll take a look at this in, in more detail in class. Uh, so I will see you next time.